Anyway, I know this is Pastor Appreciation Week, and I didn't want to just forget about it, so I just thought I would just say, as far as uh, Brother Danny, um, I've heard him say over and over and over that he was called to be a preacher here at this church about 24 years ago. And when he answered that call, he was just like a prophet. We've been studying prophets in our Sunday school class, and it's really been a lot of fun because every time we'd study one, it'd be somebody else different and how the Lord had spoke to them. Well, Brother Danny was like that. He was a prophet because God gave him words to say, and he said them. And there's been many a soul saved at this church. And, of course, there have been many people that have walked away from the Lord, too. And that's really sad. And I think we all need to to think about the ones that have gone and just try to get them back in. But uh, sometimes people don't want to listen. Um, we may not be called to preach, but we have the same job to do that the preacher does. We have that job that we can go out and bring others in, and, and sometimes they don't want to listen. Sometimes they'll say, uh, don't talk to me about that. I just don't want to hear it. I'm not ready right now. When I get everything in order, I'm going to join the church. Well, joining the church hasn't got a thing to do with it. And I say, you know, if you don't get your, right, your heart right with the Lord, then it doesn't make any difference whether you're a member of the church or not. But anyway, uh, sometimes we miss uh, opportunities to do things. And to, the other day, I almost missed one. I was down waiting on Sierra to come in. And uh, while, she, while I was sitting in the car, I looked over and there was a young girl in the car next to me. And she was reading something. So I just said, well, I'm going to ask her what she's reading now that somebody prompted me to do that, and I said it must have been the Lord. But anyway, I said maybe I'll just ask her what she's reading. And so I looked over at her, and she got on the telephone talking to somebody. So I said, well, that was good. I didn't have to ask her. And then I felt like Philip, and I hope I'm not getting too loud here. Uh, I felt like Philip. You know, Philip had to run the eunuch down in the desert just to tell him what he was reading. And, uh, and this is what I felt like, because I, I asked this woman what she was reading. Uh, if I asked her this, then she probably might tell me it's none of my business. But anyway, I did. I said, uh, what are you studying? And she said, oh, I'm reading my Bible. And she held it up. And I said, oh, good. I said, what, what chapter are you studying? I mean, what book are you studying in? She said, I'm studying in Romans. She said, every morning I get up, and if I'm going through something, I look up the scripture, and I write it down. I mean, I say it to myself, and then I write it down, and then I put it on the refrigerator, and I read it all day long as I'm going through the day. And she said, by the end of the day, I know that scripture. And I said, well, that's great. So then I said, I've been studying in Jeremiah. I think Jeremiah is a, a prophet that, you know, you just want to read more and more about these prophets because they went through a lot. I always told Ernie I didn't want to be Ezekiel because I didn't want to lay out there in the middle of the courtyard hollering at a rock because that's what the God told him to do, you know. And uh, then he said there were so many things Ezekiel did that was so strange. And today, if we did things like that, people would say they need to be in a loony bed or somewhere. <laughs> and I said, I couldn't understand why God made him do all those things. But anyway, getting back to the girl, uh, I was telling her, I said, do you know, I said, my, my granddaughter just got saved not too long ago and my children have started coming to church and they've all getting back right with the Lord. And she said, uh, how old is your granddaughter? And I said, well, she's 18. And, and I said, she's in school. That's who I'm waiting on. So she's, oh, she just got so excited. She started saying, oh, that's so great. That's so wonderful. That, that's just wonderful somebody got saved. So when Sierra came out, she started with Sierra. And she was saying, oh, I'm so proud of you. You're so wonderful. She said, don't let anybody talk you into 
turning back your turning your back on the Lord. She said, "You just go through every day and just thank the Lord for everything He's done for you." And so we we must have sat there about forty five minutes talking to that girl, and I said, "Oh Lord, thank you." I sh- I'd almost missed that opportunity. I almost didn't roll my window down, and I almost didn't ask her what she was reading. But anyway, I would have missed the blessing because when I left over there, I told Sierra, I said, man, I said, you know, I almost missed the blessing because I started not to talk to that girl, (laughs) but I did anyway. But anyway, God talked to people all the way through the Bible. He was always... um, talking and trying to get the children of Israel to turn back to him. And so sometimes we we don't listen to God either. We God can tell us to do something and we don't listen to him either. And uh, so like I said a while ago, uh, we've been studying the prophets in our Sunday school class. And I'd like to take a minute right here to invite you to Sunday school. Those that don't come, come to Sunday school. Yeah, there's so much going on. You, you know, you learn something, and then you get in in church and learn something else. But I think we learn more in Sunday school sometimes, you know, because I don't get in here like everybody else does. I'm always late coming in because I'm back there with the children. But anyway, uh, my, last, my scripture is coming from Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10, if you want to find that. But I'd like to tell you a little background about this, uh, about Jeremiah, because I think Jeremiah is a really interesting person. He went through a lot of things. He went through, um, he had to tell these children something that God had told him. But anyway, it says the book of Jeremiah contains prophecies that were given during the lowest point in the history of Judah, the beginning of the exile of Jews to Babylon in the early 6th century B.C. Now, uh, Judah and Israel had, for those that read the Bible, had separated. They became two nations. And, of course, uh, Israel was taken captive by um, Assyria, I think. And uh, then Judah was left, and the temple was in Judah. And this is where God dwelt. Uh, not that God stayed right there, but he dwelt there in Jerusalem with the children because they went to the temple and they worshipped him there. And this was the temple that Solomon built. And uh, this was about the time of King Josiah. Now, if you know about the Bible, King Josiah was the youngest king that there was. He was eight years old when he became king. But by the time he not, he was 19... Uh, he's, the temple had been turned upside down and, and messed over and they were in doing the temple cleaning the temple up and they found the book of laws and Josiah read the book uh, had the book of laws read to the children and they uh, from then they uh, started to live in a little bit right but a little bit's not enough with God because God says all the way. Okay, but King Josiah had been instituting reforms and Judah seemed to be making a turnaround. Nevertheless, the Lord's judgment was certain. God had already said what he was going to do. And the wickedness of Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather, only added weight to the sins of the nation that had been heaping up for years, and as a result, God vowed to allow Judah to go into captivity. Now, Brother Danny's told you before that a vow is something that you, when you make it, you better keep it. And God was the same way. When he made a vow and he said he was going to send the children of Israel into captivity, he meant it. He, did, he wasn't kidding around with them. And he told them they were going to be there 70 years when they went. And they were there 70 years. Uh, So Judah had to go into captivity. Well, in the fact that the Lord repeated his intentions, even Josiah had, this was after he had done the repairs to the temple. The devastating humiliation of Israel occurred during Jeremiah's lifetime. 
<clears throat> so Jeremiah was living during this time. The Babylonians attacked Jerusalem three times. Now, they attacked them the first time and took some of them captive, and then they come back, took some more of them captive, and, and then, um, then they come back and just destroyed the temple and took everything, took all the gold and everything that was there. And so, anyway, Jeremiah continued to warn the people to turn back to the Lord. He begged them to give up their idols and challenged them to practice inward holiness towards God and outward integrity towards each other. And he cautioned them against making military alliance with a foreign country, particularly Egypt. Now, this is where they wanted to run. Every time anything happened, they wanted to go get Egypt to come back and help them uh, fight their battles. And they did for once or twice. But then when Egypt went back, God told them, don't go over to Egypt and get any help from these people. He said, you need to stop doing all these things. And he was telling it through Jeremiah. Yet the people of Judah ignored the warnings. They questioned whether God would allow Jerusalem to be captured. And they thought it was impossible that their temple would be destroyed. They imagined that because the agreement with them and God to give, that he would give them special attention and protection. But that wasn't true. God loved them, just like he loves us. But if, if we don't follow his commandments and do like he wants us to do, then we have to pay the consequences. And that's just exactly what he did right here. Okay, now let's go to, let's go to Jeremiah. It says in the first two verses, in 4 and 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, that's a big thing right there. I mean, all this happened before he was even born, before he even come out of his mother and, and uh, come out of the womb. It was all happening. He had already chosen him to go out and to, to give these messages to this uh, nation. And if you, if you got that, it said he sanctified him and, I, and he ordained him a prophet. Now, usually when I'm hearing about churches, you, you get saved, you get sanctified, and you get filled with the Holy Spirit. But <laughs> I said, this was all done in the womb. He already had it all done. And it says it right there that he did. Okay, and then it says in verse 6, and this is the way we are. We're like just like this. Uh, after God told him that, he said, uh, but I can't speak. I'm just a child. Now, at this time, I figured up, I kind of figured this thing up, um, that Josiah was probably somewhere around 18 or t between 18 and 20 years old. Well, to us, that's still a child. And so um, when God was talking to him and telling him all this stuff, he was just about that age. He says, it says in chapter, I mean, in verse 6, then said I, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And don't we do that? I can't go over to that house and visit with them people. I don't know what to say. They don't like me. I don't want to go over there. I'll let somebody else go. And we use all kind of excuses when we get ready to do things. If the Lord tells you to do, I remember one time, I went out in the nursing home and I was visiting out there and I was kind of tired and I was going home and somebody was in the hospital, I don't remember who it was, but anyway, I said, I don't want to go to the hospital. I said, I think I'll just go on home. I've done done the visiting today, I'm, that's enough. The Lord saw me what I did, I'll go home. Well, I got to the stoplight right down there where the post office is at and my car run hot. Well, Ernie worked about a block away, so I called him up and I said, hey, I said, my car run hot. And he said, well, can you drive it over here where I'm at? And I said, yeah. And so 
I drove it over there and he put water in it and I'd let it run out of water. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he fixed it up and I got on the road again and got down to the other road and the car made a little skipping thing. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to the hospital. <laughs> so I did. I went on to the hospital because I knew good and well he was trying to tell me something. And I felt better after I went because when I saw the people that I went to see, I wish I could remember who it was, but I can't. <laughs> so we use excuses all the time to think about, I mean, when we when God asks us to do something, maybe God doesn't just tap us on the head and say, hey, I'm God, listen to me, I want you to do something. Uh, but he'll tell you in a small voice or maybe show you somebody or something, somewhere you need to go visit somebody. Okay, and the Lord said in verse 7 and 8, he said, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee, and whoso or whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Now, you know what? I thought about this verse this morning. I said, man, I look at all them people out there, and when I'm talking, I'm going to be scared to death. <laughs> And, and the Lord just said to me, no, you're not. I'm going to be with you up there. So, but anyway, in this verse, the Lord tells Jeremiah not to be afraid that he's going with him. And doesn't he do the same thing with us? Matthew 28:20 20 says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. That's a long time to the end of the world. We don't know if that's going to be tomorrow. They don't, we don't know if it's going to be years from now, but it could be now. It could be this very minute. It could end. So in verse 9 and 10, it says, And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Now that's something. Now that happened in, with Isaiah too. Now, Isaiah, God had the, the angel went to the uh, where the coals, hot coals were and put a hot coal in Isaiah's mouth. And then, I think it was Ezekiel that he made eat a, a scroll that tasted like honey. So, And that was, there was words on the scroll on both sides. But anyway, God always will give you the words. How many times have you ever been somewhere and you just don't know what to say? You say, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to see them people over there. They, they're sick. And you go in and something's really tragic happened to them and you say, I know how you feel. I hate to hear somebody say that. You don't know how they feel. I mean, they could be laying up there with a broke leg and just every bone just rubbing against one another and you say, I know how you feel. No, you don't. Or if you've lost a loved one and you say, I know how you feel. No, you don't. Because that loved one might have meant more to them than it did your loved one means to you. Because some of mine I, I don't get along with, but I try. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Brother Danny says you can't uh, not love somebody. I said, I know I don't, I love them. I just don't like them. <laughs> he said, you can't do that. <laughs> he said, you can't tell somebody that you don't, I mean, you've got to, if you love them, you got to like them. I said, no. <laughs> uh, I've got family members, I, I love them. I love them. I just don't like what the, the way their ways, you know, and you can talk to them and they don't want to listen, so I just love them anyway, you know. Okay, then he goes on and he says, See, I have this day set over nations and over kingdoms, set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. You know, God always gave uh, a provision of something he was going to do. 
He wasn't just going to send those children over to Babylonia and let them stay over there and just not have anything else to do with them. He loved those children. He loved them just like he loves us. When we do wrong, he loves us just as much as he does when you're doing right. It just makes him sad. So, uh, don't it make you sad when people refuse to listen to you? Sure you do. When you go out and you try to witness to somebody and they don't really want to hear you. I've tried to talk to people about the Lord and they, they'll just let me know right away. Uh, I don't want to really hear about this. And I'll say, well, you're going to want to hear about it one day. And you're going to remember what I say. So I say it anyway. And, of course, they don't like that either. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm going to read you something out of here that it's not a joke this time and it won't be no shingle joke. I won't leave you hanging here. <laughs> I, I thought that thing over and over last time I was up here and I read that shingle joke and I said, I just walked right off the stage right after it was over. <laughs> it says, while taking a class in photography, I, I was acquainted with a young man named Charles who was also a student at a school training for the Summer Olympics as a high diver. Charles was very patient with me and I witnessed to him for hours about Jesus Christ and how he, he had to be, had saved me. Because Charles had not been raised in a family that attended any kind of church, all that I had to tell him was fascinating to him. He even began to ask questions about forgiveness of sin. Finally, the day came, and I asked if he realized his own need of a Redeemer and if he were ready to trust Christ as his Savior. I saw his countenance fall and guilt in his face, but his reply was a strong no. And that's what I was talking about a while ago. Sometimes we get no, and we just have to keep trying. In the days that followed, he was quiet. I felt that he was avoiding me until one evening I got a phone call. It was Charles. <clears throat> and he wanted to know where to look in the New Testament for the verses that I had given him about salvation. I gave him the references of several passages. And I asked if I could meet him somewhere. And he declined my offer, but he thanked me for the scriptures. I could tell that he was greatly troubled, but I did not know where he was or how to help him. Because he was training for the Olympic Games, Charles had privilege, special privileges at the university pool facility. Sometime between 10.30 and 11 o'clock p.m. that evening, he decided to go for a swim and practice a few dives. It was a clear night in October and the moon was big and bright. Because the pool was housed under a ceiling of glass panes, the moon shone bright across the top of the wall in the pool area. Charles climbed to the highest platform to take his first dive. At that moment, the Spirit of God began to convict him of his sins. All of the scripture he had read, all of the occasions of witnessing to him about Christ flooded his mind. He stood backwards on the platform to make his dive. He spread his arms and gathered his balance and looked at the wall. And on the wall he saw a shadow that was caused by the light of the moon. It was the shape of a cross. He could bear the burden of his sin no longer, and he broke down. He sat down on the platform and he asked God to forgive him and to save him. He trusted Jesus Christ 20-some feet in the air. Suddenly the lights of the pool area came on. The attendant came in to check the pool. As Charles looked down at the plat from the platform, he saw that the pool was empty, which had been drained for repairs. He had almost plummeted to his death because the cross had stopped him from this disaster. But God forbid that, we should, that I should glory saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Galatians 6, 14. 
and that's all I have. So, uh, anybody want to testify? <laughs> We've got to take up some time here. All right, Carolyn. 